Hi, my name is Zach McGee. I'm a senior vice president and head of business and legal affairs for Miramax. I'm also the chairman of New Media Legal Publishing here in Los Angeles. Today's topic, defending the boss, preparing di CEOs, directors, and other senior executives to testify in depositions is an exciting and fun one. I actually have a very unique perspective on this topic for a couple of reasons. First of all, when I started my practice, uh, I was a uh, litigator at Davis Polk and Wardwell, where I did many, many depositions, uh, mostly for uh, large clients who were defendants in securities or M&A matters, uh, and those often had many, many depositions, and in that context, worked on some cases such as the Oracle hostile takeover of PeopleSoft, represented J.P. Morgan Chase, represented Bank of America, and others in securities and M&A litigation, as well as some issuers. So had a lot of deposition experience as an outside lawyer, uh, you know, working at Davis Polk. It, then after a few years at Davis Polk, uh, I went in-house uh, at NBC Universal here in LA, uh, where I was doing litigation again, this time as an in-house lawyer, and in that capacity uh, would be preparing uh, witnesses who worked at NBC Universal for their depositions, uh, often in connection with outside counsel. Uh, so I have experience as an in-house lawyer uh, preparing uh, my colleagues and clients uh, in an in-house capacity. And then finally, now at Miramax, uh, I, I've become a senior executive at Miramax and, and now have more of a business role and less of a legal role and, and certainly less of a litigation role. So I also have that perspective uh, in, in, sense, in the sense of being a senior executive uh, involved in uh, working with other senior executives. And uh, I think I have a pretty good sense of uh, some of the issues and, and how many senior executives look at litigation and look at the deposition process in particular. The last thing uh, is, uh, as a result of my experience as an outside lawyer in depositions, I am the co-author of a deposition prep video program. It's called Deposition Testimony, Five Simple Rules. Uh, didn't write the book on deposition preparation uh, by any means, but I did uh, co-write the video. Uh, so I have that experience uh, to bring to this topic as well. So in terms of what we're going to do today, just thinking about the agenda, we're first going to talk about lawyer preparation, uh, and this is, uh, you can think about the Sun Tzu quote, you know, every battle is won, every battle is won before it's even fought. Preparation really is critical, uh, and it's preparation uh, not only of the witness but of the lawyer, and, and you as the lawyer being prepared uh, before you sit down to meet with your client and certainly before the client goes into a deposition. We've broken that into three buckets, mastering the law, mastering the facts, and identifying critical witnesses. And we'll spend a little time today talking about each of those things. Then we, we turn to witness preparation, uh, and this is where you're going to be working with your witness uh, to get him or her ready to testify in a deposition. And we've thought about this in terms of four different categories, uh, preliminary matters, then substance, procedure, and finally practice. How do you actually do it? What are some things that you want to consider when you are preparing your clients to testify? So I think in terms of who can benefit from this program and, and how I approach it, it's certainly going to be very useful for uh, newer litigators, litigators who haven't had a lot of experience with depositions. Maybe this is your first time preparing a witness to testify, maybe your second or third. Uh, but we're also going to be talking about some more advanced concepts, and in particular, some of the rules that apply when you're prepping more senior executives. So I think about it this way. Everything that we're going to cover today uh, is going to apply to any deposition in a civil case. You're going to get uh, advice about how to prepare your witness. It's going to apply to any witness that you may be representing. But we're also going to focus uh, at various times on senior executives and some of the challenges that they present when you happen to find yourself representing a CEO or a director or a very senior uh, person at a company. There are certainly some advantages of having a more senior and more sophisticated witness as your client, but there are some unique challenges and that's what we're going to cover today. So let's move to our first topic, which is mastering the law. I'm not going to say too much about this today, uh, other than to note that it's very important. Preparation is critical in terms of defending a case uh, or being the plaintiff in a case. It's very important that you know the substantive area of law. You need to know what you need to prove if you're the plaintiff or what the plaintiff needs to prove if you're the defendant. If, if you have cross claims, what are the elements of those cross claims? Or your defenses, what are the elements of your defenses? Of course, the legal framework is really the, the baseline for everything. Discovery is about uh, uncovering facts that are relevant to some uh, claim, some element, some defense. So unless you know very well uh, the elements of your uh, cause of action or you know, if you're the defendant, the plaintiff's uh, cause of action and how to rebut them, uh, you're not going to do a very good job preparing the witnesses because you're not going to know what's relevant and what isn't relevant. It's also very good in this process to read 
the jury instructions. You, it's never too early to start thinking about the end game. And of course, uh, you know, so very few of all civil cases go to trial. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't pay attention uh, to what the jury instructions uh, you know, of your particular causes of action would say. Because again, that's how the issue ultimately would be framed for the jury in that particular circumstance. And you can work backwards to the particular facts of your case. Um, you also want to be aware of the, the summary judgment standard and, and any burden shifting uh, that may occur. If it's an employment case, there's uh, certain burdens that must be met, and then if certain initial burdens are met, that would shift the burden back. Uh, you know, it would shift the burden to the defendant, then who can in rebuttal shift the burden back to the plaintiff. It's important to understand how that works in terms of what a prima facie case is, what uh, you can use to rebut that case, what you can use to rebut the rebuttal, etc. The point is, you just need to understand very uh, carefully and in depth the specific causes of action that you're dealing with in the case before you can think about how best to prepare your witness. So other than knowing the law, the next major issue here is, is having your theory of the case. Of course, this is something that you're developing from the moment you get the call if you're outside counsel hey, we've had this issue or we have this lawsuit, here it is, you need to develop a theory of the case that fits the facts and that ultimately supports your position, whether you're the plaintiff uh, trying to substantiate your causes of action or you're the defendant who's trying to rebut them. You need to have a theory of the case that fits with the facts and that ties everything together. The only thing that you should also be aware of is that theory of the case may change. Uh, you certainly are going to have some view of the case, some theory of the case when you start, and then as you learn more, uh, both from your own witnesses and potentially depositions from the other side, be prepared for that theory to be modified, sometimes discarded and replaced with a, a completely new theory. But whatever happens, you need to have a theory that ties together all of the evidence uh, and something that you can cons cons consistently be revising as you go along. So that's mastering the law. Let's turn now to mastering the facts. So the first thing is obviously analyzing all of your documents. Uh, that's the documents that you produce as well as any documents that were produced to you in discovery. Uh, you, you, and of course this is, if you're a more junior lawyer, you may be very well familiar with this part of the process because generally that's where uh, junior litigation associates cut their teeth uh, in terms of reviewing and analyzing and writing memos, summarizing uh, the key points of documents that you've collected and produced or that have been produced and collected for you. So that's really critical is being able to understand what do your documents show. You often get a very different picture of a case uh, as a result of the documents that are produced versus what people may tell you in your interviews simply because uh, there may be different people at the company now than uh, you know were there then and people just forget. Documents in some sense have uh, an infinite memory uh, whereas witnesses are much more limited. The second thing is ensuring e-discovery compliance and this is of course critical in today's world and litigation of today. Um, Senior executives, and this is one point where I would pause um, and, and note a specific issue with senior executives. Senior executives, uh, and I'm going to generalize a little bit today, every witness is different, but in general, uh, senior executives don't always do the best job of searching for their documents. And that's for a couple reasons. The first is they're busy people. Uh, they may or may not be giving you, uh, giving the litigation and your litigation hold or your request as much uh, uh, notice or in mu as much importance as they should, or um, they may delegate the, the task of searching their files to an assistant or perhaps even their entire group if, if it's uh, someone who has a, a large number of direct reports. So that really presents a challenge because often uh, even an assistant, an executive assistant, isn't going to know necessarily everywhere that his or her uh, boss has documents. So you may end up in a situation where your senior executive didn't do a great job of searching and there's some gaps and, and by and large those gaps will uh, make themselves known in a deposition when the other side's lawyer is uh, you know, carefully questioning your client, uh, your witness, about what he or she did specifically to collect his or her documents. Um, obviously the e-discovery area, uh, it's, it's far beyond the scope of, of this presentation. There are many, many other presentations uh, you, can, you can watch about all the e-discovery issues. Uh, I would just note here that each and every witness needs to be prepared, uh, and this is equally true for senior executives, to talk in detail about what he or she did to collect 
all responsive documents. It's no longer the case that you can get a pass on that sort of stuff and just say, oh, you know, my lawyers handled it or, you know, other people, the, the general counsel is responsible for that. Really, everybody who sits for a deposition today needs to be prepared for extensive questioning in that area. And so you, you certainly need to do that with senior executives as well. And, and the reason is that uh, a lack of documents or a lack of a thorough search for documents um, can turn a small, <laughs> meritless case into a real problem. Um, if you have exposure in terms of failing to preserve documents that you were supposed to preserve or failing to do a thorough search, again, the, there are many e-discovery um, presentations that will cite a number of examples of judges sanctioning uh, clients for this or you know, ordering adverse inferences be drawn, et cetera. And, and you can really lose the leverage in the litigation. You, you may have a, a small, meritless case that you feel very confident about but if it turns out you didn't do a great job of searching for your documents, the leverage shifts and all of a sudden you have a problem that you may have to throw money at to get rid of it. So that's really important advice and particularly important for uh, dealing with senior executives. The next thing is uh, you know, reviewing the comprehensiveness of the discovery responses and document production. You're going to most likely be doing that with your uh, in-house clients, uh, but uh, of course any witness can be asked about uh, interrogatory responses uh, or uh, you know, responses to requests for production. So you need to make sure that you've done a good job of uh, responding to the discovery that's out there, particularly if you want to press the other side for documents that they were supposed to have pr provided. If you live in a glass house there, uh, you're going to have problems. The last thing is inquiring about potential impeachment material. And we're going to talk in just a second about this in more detail. But in today's world, that means uh, Facebook. It means YouTube. Uh, it means Twitter. It means any blogs. It's, it's now a good idea to have a you know, laundry list of questions to ask any witness. Well, do you have a blog? Do you use Twitter? Uh, what, what about your Facebook page? Because now that stuff is out there. And it's very easy for anyone to get a hold of it. The other side's lawyer in your case will have ready access to that stuff. And uh, you may unfortunately be surprised about some of the things that your witnesses uh, choose to post on Facebook or, or, or choose to tweet. So now we'll focus in a little bit on senior executives uh, and, and some critical points that you need to pay attention to in this area. The first thing is being sure to obtain all handwritten notes from uh, your witness. So this is interesting. I don't, can't generalize about anyone. Uh, everyone is different. Uh, you know, you have some witnesses who are pack rats. They, uh, you know, save every scrap of paper and you ask them to produce their files and they've got boxes and files and et cetera. Then you have others who have nothing at all. Uh, so you're, you may have a senior executive who's a pack rat. You may have a senior executive who has nothing at all. I would say, in general, senior executives tend toward the nothing at all uh, camp more than more junior folks, generally because in, in the hierarchy, uh, you're not the one. If you're the most junior person on the team, you're the one who's expected to have all the backup documents, all the memos, et cetera. The, you, know, you imagine the CEO or the director coming in. He, doesn't ha he or she doesn't have any files. They sit down at the table. They get to hear presentations. They leave. They usually don't even take the presentations with them. So you tend to have a problem with senior executives in the sense that you may not have a lot of documents from them. And of course, you don't want a situation where you've missed documents or you, one of your key uh, witnesses in the case who happens to be a senior vice president of X doesn't produce anything from his or her personal file. So it, it may well be the case that he or she has nothing, but you really need to press them to make sure you have everything, including any written notes that they may have. Uh, written notes, I'm talking to litigators here, I'm sure we've all had many, many cases where a handwritten note becomes very important in a case, in part because it's some cryptic scribbling that was made uh, you know, many years ago by someone who now doesn't really remember what he or she said, but that's uh, susceptible to an interpretation that the plaintiff really likes or that the defendant it really likes, and then that becomes a big issue in the case. So it's really important to have those notes and to really press uh, to make sure that you've collected everything that the client has. Um, another thing with regard to written notes is your senior executive may be a lawyer. I you shouldn't overlook that. I mean, certainly there's the general counsel, uh, who obviously in most cases, I would guess all cases, is a lawyer. But you may find that there are other senior executives who are lawyers, or at least who have law degrees. Now, that raises the issue are they practicing as a lawyer? Are they now a business person? And some people occupy a space kind of in between. I think in, in my case, I am head of business and legal affairs. My job is probably half business, half legal. I certainly do consider myself practicing as a lawyer uh, in most of what I do. And I would then you know, take the position that most of what I do is privileged. Uh, so you just need to be aware that maybe a uh, you know, president of a division or your chief operating officer, uh, that person may be a lawyer. And if that person is a lawyer, then you need to think about whether you can take the position 
position that his or her documents are privileged. It's a little bit of a double-edged sword sometimes. Uh, if you say that somebody is, is a business person and therefore uh, you know, not a lawyer, then you don't have the privilege uh, attaching to them. But if that's uh, you know, sort of how they really operate, they're not really uh, representing clients, they're uh, acting only in a business capacity, you just need to think through these issues because it is important. The next thing is uh, laptop computers or other personal devices. Uh, again, senior executives tend to use these more than sort of rank and file employees. So you need to make sure that if uh, the, the, uh, your witness has a laptop, that you search the laptop. If the uh, witness has remote access to his or her uh, computer from home. You need to make sure that if there are any documents that he or she saved to his or her personal computer at home that you get those documents. Um, it, it's one of those things where the more access that people have, the more places they can uh, be storing documents uh, that you need to search for. And, and with senior executives, it's certainly more of an issue. So then the next thing is the, I, I hate to say the fun uh, topic, but avoiding impeachment horror stories. So this goes back to asking your client about Twitter, or asking your client about Facebook or YouTube. Um, I, with with uh, the general uh, extent to which people today are willing to share um, information about themselves online, it certainly leads to horror stories. Uh, a couple of them are listed here. One was uh, a very senior executive who posted on Facebook a picture of him and his girlfriend attending a pimp and prostitute party. Uh, you know, it's, it's the sort of thing that the other side's lawyer can very easily find. And if there's an issue in the case that's, let's say it's an, it's an employment case, in, in many cases, employment cases, you, you think of many things as being very fair game. If there's an allegation of, you know, uh, uh, bias on the basis of sex or race, whatever it is, uh, you may have some impeachment material that, you know, they will dig up. And, and it's better for you preparing a witness to know about that stuff than to find out about it uh, as a matter of surprise, because the other side's lawyer is going to get that outside of the discovery process. They don't need any kind of subpoena to get Facebook information necessarily uh, if they have access to it through someone who you know can can access it um, without having to go to Facebook. It's certainly much more available than it used to be. Another example is somebody blogging uh, about Proposition Eight, and it turned out that this was a case about sexual orientation discrimination. So. Again, these, these sorts of personal facts uh, are never going to be uh, good for you in the case, but you really need to know if they exist uh, in advance so you can be prepared for them and so you can prepare your witness for them as well. So the next thing is, uh, for the lawyers, identifying the key players. So you need to figure out, based on your understanding of the case, who the key witnesses were. Uh, now it may be a mix of people who are still at the company today and people who have left, but you, you know, through your sources, you should identify who the key witnesses are. And in general, you want to interview those key witnesses separately. Uh, and the main reason for that is that you want to avoid cross-contamination of their testimony. You want to hear from each of them separately uh, so that you're, you know, not accused of, well, I I would say there's two things. The first thing is, substantively, you want to get uh, independent answers from each of the witnesses, because in that way, you'll have heard one story from one witness, and you'd like it if that same story is confirmed independently by a second witness, as opposed to both witnesses sitting there together. And you know, because one person says something, the other person tends to agree, particularly if it's uh, one is the boss and one is the subordinate. They're not likely to disagree with the boss, even if they uh, have a different take on something. And you want to know both of those things. The second thing is you want to avoid any perception that you um, you know, got everybody in a room to get their story straight. Now, obviously, the privilege protects what you say uh, when you're meeting with your witnesses to prepare them for deposition, but it doesn't uh, extend to who was present. So the facts about who was in the room, how long the meeting lasted, who was present, that is not privileged. And that certainly would be something the other side's lawyer may ask about. So if you hypothetically uh, got together and you had you know, five employees in the room and there were three or four lawyers there and you were preparing, you could you know, raise the, the other side could certainly draw the uh, information or make the argument that you got everybody in a room so that you could get their story straight. And then they would all go and just repeat the same story. Uh, so that's what you want to avoid. The other thing is, um, and, and I touched on it a, a minute ago, uh, the privilege. So I think it's always very important. Y obviously, witnesses don't need to know much about the attorney-client privilege. Anything that comes up in a deposition, uh, you can certainly tell them anything that was a communication with counsel, or if you have any question about whether the information is sensitive or privileged, you should stop and you should ask for a break and then we can talk about it. That's, that's certainly the right advice and you never want a witness making any kind of privilege calls. But what I think is useful is you should tell the witness that the privilege doesn't extend to these basic facts about your interviews, such as when, when was it, you know, who was there, what time, 
those sorts of things. Because I think that when, um, if a witness is only told that there is this thing called the privilege and it generally covers your interactions with lawyers, they will get very nervous in the deposition when the other side's lawyer starts asking them questions about how many times you met with your lawyer and who was there and where did the meeting happen. Rather than have them be concerned about that, it, it, it's better, I think, to, to let them know, look, you can answer the questions about who was there and when it took place and how you know and, and how many people how many times we met but that's it i think that's a good way to handle it so that they don't get uh, worried when they're in that sort of zone the other thing is um, in terms of when you are meeting with the witness it's often really good to ask open-ended questions and this is more true for senior executives than it is for more junior folks. You'll find that when you're interviewing more junior folks, a lot of times your mission with that witness is very narrow. You know, you're talking to somebody in the finance group because there's an issue about some invoice and you just want to know, you know, was the invoice prepared and how did, you know, is this a copy of the invoice? Were there any issues here? You're, you're trying to confirm something very narrow, so you may go into those interviews with more of a, you know, kind of a confirming mode and just asking the specific questions that you're interested in. As you get more senior, uh, where people have a broad swath of responsibility and sort of a, a, a bigger perspective on the case, it's, more, it's important to focus on asking more open-ended questions because it's, it's much more likely in that case you're going to learn things that you don't know and you want to be a little bit like uh, the, you know, the lawyer taking the deposition may ask, well, you know, what, tell me about that, you know, so that you can really elicit some facts that you may not know which may be helpful to you in terms of you know, understanding the entire case as a whole. So then the last thing is uh, instructing witnesses not to discuss the lawsuit with anyone other than their counsel. Uh, I, I put this in the category of nothing good ever comes from discussing a lawsuit. <laughs> it's sort of like, you know, nothing good ever comes from discussing an HR issue. You know, if you're having some HR employment issue in your company, the worst thing that can happen is people emailing about so-and-so employee or so-and-so issue. It's just always creating bad facts. Uh, you know, hopefully those facts um, are in privileged communications. But in any case, it's, it's great advice uh, for everyone that you're preparing to instruct them not to discuss the lawsuit with anyone. And then I think for senior executives who might uh, have more experience being involved in sensitive matters, they might, you know, without your instruction, feel more uh, comfortable having those kinds of conversations with others at their level. It's really important to instruct them that that's not something you should do when you're talking about litigation. So the next thing on this subject is uh, the issue of former employees. You want to think about, uh, and if possible, go out, if you can, uh, and find and interview former employees who were involved uh, in the facts uh, that are at issue in your case. It, you, in many cases, you'll find that uh, because of changes in the company's structure or changes in its business, uh, there may be some issue that no one has any current involvement with, a, a line of business that was discontinued or a particular practice that, that was replaced by some new procedure. So it, it may be important to really understand how things worked five uh, years ago that you go out and you talk to former executives. Um, that of course then raises the question of whether you should represent them or not. Um, there's a couple legal issues here. The first is whether there's any kind of conflict of interest. Uh, certainly you can't represent a former employee if that former employee has a conflict of interest with the company that you represent. So, you know, often in an employment case you have that issue, let's say it's a, a sex discrimination case and the alleged harasser is the former employee. Uh, you know, there may be a, a legal issue in terms of having a conflict representing that employee, particularly if the company's position is going to be that he or she acted very independently and, you know, in, in uh, contrary to all of the training and instructions that the company gave. So that's obviously one issue. The other is whether the other side can contact uh, that former employee. So we all know that if you represent a company, uh, the other side's lawyer can't contact anyone in that company directly. Uh, that's, you know, they have to go through you. You can't contact an unrepresented person. Uh, in the case of a former employee, it's less clear uh, because until you are representing them, they are not uh, an unrepresented party. They're just a party. Uh, but there's also the practical question about whether this former employee would voluntarily talk to the other side's lawyer. Um, so if you have a situation where a former employee, uh, you know, works for a close uh, customer of your clients or there's some other strong relationship there. You may have more flexibility in terms of whether you want to represent them or not. Um, we're going to uh, talk in a minute about a lot of good reasons to represent former employees. Uh, there, of course, is cost associated with that. But um, if you have reasonable confidence that the former employee is still very loyal to your client and is in a position where he or she is not likely to talk to the uh, counsel for the other side 
outside of the formal deposition process. That's one factor you could consider in terms of whether you feel that you need to represent them. But in another case, if it's a former employee with whom there is no current relationship, and it's certainly somebody that um, the uh, other side's lawyer could call up, and if that person wants to agree to sit down with the other side's lawyer, that could be a bad situation for your client. So in that case, you may want to uh, you know, consider representing that person uh, and incurring that cost in order to uh, require that, that uh, the other side's lawyer go through you with any communications. The other issue here is outside of the legal issues are the tactical issues. And I mentioned the, the example of the potential harasser. Uh, you know, you may have a legal conflict with that person, which would prevent you from representing both the company and that witness. But you also have the tactical question of if you get into uh, a trial, again, trials are rare, but uh, if you're there at counsel table at trial and you're sitting, you know, right next to the alleged harasser, um, that's going to give a perception to the jury about whether the company is uh, supportive of that person or, you know, whether they're distinct or not. And it's very difficult to create any kind of separation between uh, the individual and the company if they have the same counsel. So I think there's a tactical issue here that you need to consider in every case. Uh, but I would say in the, in the majority of cases, uh, you, you know, the, the balance will tip in favor of representing former employees. Uh, just because you have increased control, you're, you're able to prep them, the other side's lawyer isn't able to talk to them without uh, your permission. So I think generally the, the, the scales will tip in that favor. But these are the sorts of issues that you need to ask yourself uh, both legally and tactically before you make that call. The other thing is, uh, what about the witness? Uh, did he or she leave on friendly terms? So, of course, a lot of people don't leave on friendly terms. You know, they're, they're a former employee for a reason. Uh, there was some falling out, there was some change in leadership, and they were let go. This can often be a very difficult situation. If you're the outside counsel and you work for Company X and you're calling up a former employee of Company X who uh, was let go and feels that he or she uh, shouldn't have been let go, can be a challenge. There's a couple ways I've found in my experience that you can uh, deal with that. One is taking advantage of the separation that you have uh, from the company. So you're outside counsel, you're not in-house counsel, uh, and you can, I think, in many ways, diffuse a little bit of that uh, kind of anger or uh, you know angst by building your own personal relationship with the witness. One of the things that you'll find, and those of you who've done a lot of depositions know this, uh, some of the closest relationships that I've made in terms of uh, with, with attorney-client relationships have been uh, representing witnesses in depositions. You, uh, if you're able to prepare a witness well and have that witness come out of a deposition uh, having done a great job, you will build uh, a client for life uh, and sometimes even a friend for life. It's one of those experiences, very stressful often for the witness, and if you can be one of the people that helps them make it through uh, and, and does a great job for themselves and for their company, you're, you're the hero and you've, you've made a client for life. So, so a lot of that sort of personal relationship that you can build, helping somebody get ready for an unpleasant experience like a deposition, can help you with some of these for, former employees who you know, may be disgruntled or what have you. The second thing is the ability to pay a former employee for his or her prep time. Uh, so the you know, offering to pay somebody if they uh, are um, you know, taking time off of work and their hourly rate is you know, 50 bucks an hour or whatever it is, paying them for their prep time is another way that you can perhaps mollify some of their uh, unhappiness with the company. Of course, you have to be aware of the ethics rule there. I mean, you can only pay somebody for the reasonable value of their time spent preparing for and testifying in a deposition. You can't pay them anything extra of that, uh, but you know, uh, setting that aside, it's nice if somebody has to take time out of their lives to uh, you know sit for a deposition related to a company that they used to work for three years ago and weren't so happy about. It's it's another way to get over some of those uh, concerns. So now focusing in on senior executives, um, one of the key issues here related to joint representation is that a lot of senior executives have employment contracts. So uh, you may, your company may be under a contractual obligation to represent them in any litigation arising from their time at the company. So subject to there being uh, a legal conflict of interest, in which case it would just be that you couldn't represent them. They would have to get uh, their own counsel, also paid for by the company. Your decision whether to represent them or not may have already been decided for you by their uh, terms of their employment contract. Severance agreements uh, also are an area where uh, you, you need to be aware of those. Is a lot of times senior executives have severance agreements, and that may require them to cooperate in future litigation. It may also have uh, provided for a cash payment to them or other consideration uh, for them having you know, given the company a release. 
that's all stuff that's likely to be responsive uh, and likely uh, things that you would have to produce. Uh, and you should prepare the witness about how uh, to handle questions that asked about their, their, the terms of their separation, you know, whether they're obligated to cooperate, what, how much they were paid, because you can see these sorts of facts would be the things that the other side's lawyer might try to seize upon and say, well, you're only here because the company paid you $2 million to, you know, to, to settle out. And you, you aren't, isn't it true you're contractually obligated to be here and support the company's position? And you, know, you just have to be ready for that line of questioning when you're talking about a uh, senior executive who had a severance agreement. Um, mentioned this before, uh, you'd certainly have a lot more control over uh, the witness if you do represent them jointly with the company. You're able to prep them, you have access to them. I think that in most cases is a really critical difference and it, and it almost always, in my view, justifies the additional cost of providing the representation. Um, one flip side of this, though, is in terms of discovery obligations. So if you're representing the company, and in today's world, you know, discovery obligations are very broad in terms of not only physical records, but also electronic records. If you're undertaking this massive production on behalf of the company and you also happen to represent some former employee, you may have a little bit of trouble trying to limit the scope of documents or electronic files that are produced from that former employee. So you know, the idea here is if you're moving heaven and earth uh, to produce uh, backup tapes and uh, laptops and electronic files from your customer client, you, know, you might otherwise, if you were just representing uh, this one individual who no longer worked at the company and you were you know, his or her lawyer, you might be able to come in and say, you know, this request for documents to me is very broad. I, I don't have the capability to go and you know, look through my old files. They're you know, in some warehouse. Or I, I, you know, I, I have some electronic files, but they're in this format, and I don't want to produce them. You, you might have a lot more traction with that if you were a you know, third-party witness represented by you know, your brother-in-law, who happens to be your lawyer, versus, OK, you're, you're a former employee represented by company counsel. Company counsel is already spending hundreds of thousands of dollars you know, uh, restoring backup tapes and, and uh, dumping laptops. So just be aware of that. You may be uh, obligated to produce more documents from a former employee if you represent that former employee than you might otherwise have to do. And then um, I think the last thing here, be cautious uh, about agreeing to produce a witness for a deposition uh, if you don't control that witness. So accepting service of a subpoena or uh, saying, you know, yes, we'll produce him or her if, you know, the, the day of the deposition comes and the witness says, you know what, I'm not, uh, not going to show up. I'm sorry. I just, you know, got something else going on. This isn't a high priority for me. Uh, and, but you've agreed to produce that person. You don't have any physical uh, you know, control over him or her, and then you could have some trouble uh, in terms of your dealings with the other side and uh, potentially with the judge in the case, uh, depending on how the circumstances played out. So um, let's turn now to witnesses. We've talked a lot about what you as the lawyer need to do, how you need to prepare um, some of the key issues that you need to address. Let's talk about what you do with the witness himself. I think the first thing is uh, when, when you sit down with a witness, describing the case, the, who the players are, what, what stage of the case you're in, are we, you know, just complaints just been filed, are we at the end of discovery, are we past summary judgment, are we headed for trial, where, where you are in the litigation. I think this is more important for senior executives than it is for sort of uh, less senior executives. I think for less senior executives, they don't need to know the whole picture. You know, they're there for some narrow focus, and, and it's appropriate to keep them you know, relatively narrowly focused so that they don't hear something about some other part of the case, and then they feel like they know something that they, you know, if, if asked about in a deposition, they might be tempted to you know, speculate. You don't want that to happen. But the senior executives, th I think it's good for them to have a sense of the case overall, where their particular role fits in, uh, so that they, you know, it, it's likely for them, more likely for them, that something's going to come up in the deposition that they know a little bit about uh, because of their role in the company. And so it would be better for you to have briefed them in advance about, you know, issue with product A is, is really the issue here. Was product A defective? You know, product C and D, that's not an issue. They may try to raise some questions about those products, but, you know, focus is on A. Giving them that kind of background, I think, is, is more helpful for senior executives than it is for uh, more junior witnesses. Explaining the attorney-client privilege uh, is important. We talked a little bit about the distinction here between, uh, you know, the facts of an interview versus uh, the actual substance of the privilege. Um, when you're also talking about uh, preparing a witness, we talked about discovery, that's important, um, and uh, you, you certainly don't want to um, educate the witness about areas in which they don't have experience, and this is 
making a distinction here between a 30B6 type of a deposition where you are testifying on behalf of the company and so you have an obligation to be educated about certain topics. This is just for your normal deposition, your normal witness. You don't want to educate them about areas where they don't have uh, personal knowledge. There may or may not be circumstances where you have to uh, adjust that rule a bit. Um, it may be that in a case because uh, there are former employees who have left the company or you know, there may be some important part of the business or important facts in the case where you need someone on behalf of the company to be able to testify about some practice or some procedure and there may be a narrow instance there where you need to educate the witness. Very rare. Um, so the general rule is always if you don't know about something, uh, you, you say, I don't know, or I don't recall, you don't speculate about what uh, others in the company are doing, subject to there being very narrow circumstances where you may need to have a witness to do that. The other thing uh, here is about note taking. Uh, don't let your witness take notes in a prep session. Uh, it, it's really one of those like, hard and fast rules. You, you don't want witnesses taking notes because the argument's going to be that those notes uh, were refreshing the witness's recollection and they should be produced. And you definitely don't want notes that your uh, client is taking in a deposition uh, prep session to be uh, producible. I've, I've seen lawyers handle this in different ways, allowing a witness to take notes and then you know, saying it's a memo to counsel and taking it away for some period of time. I, I, my, my belief on this is just uh, don't, don't let the witness take notes. I think you can get the witness comfortable with you and uh, feel that if there is something important, you're going to review it with him or her uh, before the deposition. Just notes are never a good idea in terms of uh, having your client do that when you're preparing. The next one, in terms of a spotlight uh, you know, on senior executives, critical issues for senior executives in the same area, is the I don't know doesn't mean I'm stupid. Really, really critical. Uh, I think as you get more senior, uh, you tend to know more, and you tend to think you know a lot more. Uh, and sometimes you do know everything, and other times you only think you know everything. In a deposition, it's really important, no matter who you are, to only testify about those facts and events of which you have personal knowledge. Personal knowledge. You were there, you, you know, had a conversation with someone, you read a document, you were involved in some way. Senior executives tend to know a lot about what's going on in the company generally, but you don't want them to be, to be testifying about any of that. They don't have uh, a basis for it. Uh, it's subject to impeachment for that reason, uh, and it's just not going to be helpful because it may contradict what others who are more closely involved in you know, those issues would say. So this is really critical, and it's hard for senior folks. You, know, you don't see uh, CEOs saying, I don't know a lot. You know, they probably should say it more than they do. Uh, and it's, just, it's true at that level, and it's true at you know, levels below that. So it's really, this is a real challenge in one of the areas where you really need to work hard with the witness to explain, look, this is not a, um, this is not a test. This is not a test of how much you know or how smart you are or, you know, uh, being able to answer every question you're asked. That's not the purpose of a deposition. And in fact, in a deposition, if done correctly, the answer to many, many questions is going to be, I don't know. That's simply because you are one person and you were not involved in everything that a company was doing over a 10-year period that, you know, relates to the litigation at issue. But I think this is a real challenge and probably the biggest challenge in uh, representing senior executives. Second one, I'd say, is probably the second biggest challenge, checking their ego at the door. Uh, sort of similar to the first point, these guys are, they have, you know, they have big jobs, they make uh, big salaries, they are used to getting their way, they're very successful in their life. They probably feel pretty good about that. And, and getting them in a deposition setting where the other side's lawyer, depending on his or her style, uh, may be going at them in an aggressive way uh, and trying to challenge them, and that may really get them in a defensive position and wanting to, you know, uh, strike back at that. They may take a, a different approach of trying to be the witness's best friend, and so, you know, then getting the witness to just sit there all day like a professor and expound on this or that and the other thing. All of these problems are ego-related, and you need to do your best to have that uh, senior executive check his or her ego at the door, as otherwise you're going to have a really tough day in the deposition. Um, taking the deposition seriously and devoting enough time to prepare, this is often a real challenge with senior executives because they're busy, they think that uh, they know more about their business than any lawyer coming at this you know, from the other side is ever going to know, and they feel like, you know, sure, I can sit there for a couple hours and answer whatever silly questions this person is going to ask me and I'm going to be brilliant and I'm not worried about it at all. 
So that's fine, uh, except that uh, we all know that uh, a deposition is a very unique uh, practice. And the fact is that deposition testimony can be twisted, can be used, excerpted, uh, used to imply things that the witness never intended. There's a particular way you need to approach the deposition. And if the witness is not worried about it, isn't appropriately concerned, then it's likely they're going to be quite careless and you may end up having a lot of bad testimony. So a lot of this for senior executives is a little bit of scaring them straight. You need to scare them a little bit about you know, what a deposition is and what can go wrong. If you are careless in your deposition, they can use that uh, in, in a motion. They can use it at trial. They can make you look uh, very bad. They can make the company look very bad. And so the stakes are very high. You need to pay attention. You need to give me enough time to prepare you. You need to take this seriously. So that's often a challenge. Now, sometimes you'll have the opposite. You'll have a witness who's really scared. You know, the, the, Let's say it's an employment case and they are uh, somehow they were the supervisor of the person who's claiming discrimination or you know, claiming that they were terminated unfairly for some reason. And that person may feel very personal. They, they're being attacked personally and their reputation is on the line. And the company you know, could stand to lose millions of dollars if this case is sustained. So they may be quite scared. They may feel a lot of pressure. And in that case, you need to take the opposite view. You need to calm them down. You need to uh, try to reassure them that this is, if you do this uh, deposition correctly, if you follow my advice, you're going to be fine. You know, it's, it, so you have to adjust your advice to the type of witness that you have. But I think with senior executives, more often than not, you tend to find people who aren't, aren't as worried as they should be about their deposition, and they're not willing to give you the time or uh, to take it as seriously as they need to. Um, covering the basics of witness prep without talking down to the witness, this is often a challenge. Uh, we're going to talk in a minute about the deposition prep video that can help you with this. But with senior executives, you've got CEOs, you've got senior vice presidents of this or that, you got the general counsel, who, whoever it is, their time is very valuable. Uh, and they are, you know, probably have a lot of meetings and you're going to try to get, you know, two or three hours with them uh, or, you know, maybe broken up over uh, several days, whatever you're able to get. You know, sitting there and sort of saying, you know, don't volunteer, don't speculate, listen very carefully to the question, answer only that question, read every document. Sometimes it feels a little rote. It seems uh, like you're talking down to someone and they're going to, you know, uh, maybe tune out. So one way to get around that is to use a video that covers those sort of basics so that when you're in the room with the witness in those couple hours of prep time, you can really focus in on what are the critical issues in the case, what are the critical documents. You can do some role play, you can do some mock questioning. That's a better and higher use of your in-person time. Uh, but that's something you have to be aware of with senior executives is that the basic advice can, can be perceived by them to be you know, condescending. Educating the witness on matters. Uh, a, a double-edged sword. You generally don't want to educate the witness, but there may be narrow areas where you need testimony on a particular subject. There's no one else who can give it. And then in that case, you actually have to show a witness some documents to refresh his or her recollection so that he or she can testify on those subjects. That's certainly the exception, not the rule. But I think you can feel to the extent you feel good about that practice, uh, it's, it's always a little bit of a, whenever you're departing from the general rule of not educating a witness, you should, you should pause. But at least senior executives, I think, because of their role in the company, they're better choices for something like this. If you have to have someone testify about X and the only people who are still involved in X are very junior employees, you know, it's often better to have a more senior employee who's in an adjacent part of the business, maybe get up to speed a little bit on that other area. Maybe it's under his or her supervision in terms of the corporate structure, uh, but he or she isn't involved day to day. You may be better off educating that person so he or she can handle those questions as opposed to having a more junior person do it. There is a little bit of a, you know, it's, it's very circumstantial here, though, because you can take the opposite view and say, well, you know, a very middle manager or a lower level employee who only knows a few things about what he or she does, if that's enough for what you need, that might be a better choice because he or she wouldn't be subject to questions about, you know, the, the broader division or the broader business as a whole. But you just have to think about that. And depending on the level of complexity of the issues and what you need, it's just certainly something to think about. And then utilizing the witness's sophistication. This one, so we've talked a lot about what are maybe the burdens of uh, preparing senior executives to testify. You know, they don't like to say, I don't know, and they don't like to search for documents, and they don't want to give you any time. And there are some benefits, though. One of the things is these guys and women uh, tend to be very sharp, right? You, you don't get to the top of your company uh, in most cases without you know, having some smarts and having some experience and, and having been around the block a couple times, you should feel free to use that to your advantage. Uh, the story that I like to tell here is when I was doing uh, 
the Oracle PeopleSoft case uh, at Davis Polk. We represented Oracle, who was doing a, a hostile takeover of PeopleSoft. And I got to work with Larry Ellison, who's the CEO of Oracle, pr helped prepare him for his deposition and also his trial testimony. And what's amazing about someone like Larry Ellison is he's the smartest person in the room by a factor of 10. He's the smartest person you know, in the, in the neighboring state, probably by a factor of 10. Uh, and, and watching him handle questions from the other side, that was really one of those depositions uh, where you just sit back and you let your witness handle everything. Now, the challenge is there aren't that many Larry Ellisons out there, but there are a lot of people who think they're Larry Ellison, and they think that they know everything uh, there is to know, and that's pretty dangerous, and we talked about that before. But if you can uh, present them with the background, explain to them how to do a deposition, how to, how to do a winning deposition as opposed to trying to win the case, they're smart, they're experienced, they can do a great job. Some of the best depositions that I've ever seen uh, were witnesses of mine who were very senior executives who, once they understood how to play the game, were better at the game than anyone had ever seen. So that's, that's a great thing because at, at the, some of the lower levels, you know, your best hope is that this person is going to do a good job in the deposition, not get off on a tangent, not go beyond his or her scope of authority. But if you've got a really good lawyer on the other side, they're, they're going to get some stuff out of that witness. It's just, it just the nature of the beast. If a senior executive is really well prepared, is really sharp and really experienced and stays within his or her designated area, it's really tough for the other side to get good sound bites, to get good information. So that's the one benefit I think you have of uh, representing more senior witnesses. So the next thing for senior executives is limiting themselves to uh, testifying about personal knowledge and not what the company in any collective sense knew or did. This is very standard advice. You're going to give this to every witness. You should always be speaking just for yourself. You shouldn't be speaking on behalf of the company. It's just harder for senior executives because they do know more. Uh, they're used to speaking on behalf of the company. They're often the company's representative in, in business meetings or if they're uh, you know speaking engagements. So this one's a little bit harder. Uh, I think the best way to, to train witnesses about this is uh, it's innocent mistakes. You know, you may have a good sense of how your company works. You, you, you're an operations executive, so you know anything in the operations area, you, you know soup to nuts. But you know a lot about finance because you work closely with the finance team, and you know a lot about your uh, your sales group because you you obviously support sales efforts. But for you to testify about something that's very in the weeds, finance, you know, how do you uh, amortize that expense? You know, what about you know the accrual that you have there? you may know just enough to be dangerous. I mean, that's how I like to describe it to witnesses. And, and you don't want, in a deposition, to be giving any testimony that you're not absolutely sure about because you have personal knowledge. It's just any kind of innocent mistake that you make gives the other side something to work with. So I think that's how you handle senior executives who might be te tempted to testify about what the company, uh, in a collective sense, was doing or knew or didn't know. Um, focusing on giving a winning deposition. So if you can explain that the goal of a deposition is not to win the case, right? Depositions in most cases can only hurt you. Your, your goal in a deposition is to play defense. It's a basketball game, you're just playing defense. And if you can avoid letting the other side score a lot of points, that's what's called a winning deposition. The opposite is thinking of a deposition as uh, you know, trying to win the case in the deposition. You're never gonna convince the other side's lawyer that you're right and his client's wrong. That's, that's not the purpose of a deposition and it's never going to happen. And as long as they understand that that is not the goal, the goal is simply to avoid uh, letting the other side score points on you, senior executives get it they can, they, and they can be great. Um, so that's, I think, your mission as the lawyer to appropriately frame what their mission is as a witness. And once you do that, chances are they're going to do a great job. Um, using a witness preparation video, this is what we're going to talk about very shortly, one way to show senior executives and, and really all witnesses how to give a good deposition is to use a video. One of the challenges uh, before there was deposition prep video was how do you, uh, for a witness who's never sat for a deposition before, how do you describe what it is? How, how can you explain how the process works or, or what giving a good deposition is like. Now you say, well, of course, I'll, I'll tell them that there'll be a court reporter on the other side and they'll ask questions and you should just give narrow answers and, you know, I don't know if you don't know. What, you know, that's not hard to do. The, the challenge is that unless you've been in a deposition, you don't know how uh, to answer those questions in the context of a deposition. So it's the difference between being told what to do and seeing what to do and what not to do. So once uh, somebody has seen someone in a deposition, giving careless answers, speculating, uh, guessing, uh, talking about, the, you know, answering from the company, 
and then they see somebody doing it right, doing it the right way, that's what they need. Then they can say, ah, okay, I can emulate how that uh, person who gave a good deposition did. That's really the critical uh, benefit of deposition prep video, which we'll talk about shortly. So the next topic is the substance uh, for witnesses. I like to ask witnesses, what, what worries you? What worries you about this case or this deposition? Because the answer may surprise you. Uh, one example is, you know, you ask a witness what you're worried about, and the witness may say, and it, it may be a commercial dispute. It's some dispute between two big companies over a contract. And, you know, you're asking the witness, well, is there anything you're nervous about this deposition? And the witness says, well, you know, and they, they feel they trust you enough to say, yeah, well, I'm, you know, I'm involved in this divorce, and it's really nasty, and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and they may think that this divorce is going to come up in their deposition, and it, it, it won't. And so they're worried about something that is, uh, you know, you would, you would object to any question about that as being irrelevant and harassing. And so understanding what worries the witness is often a good way uh, to get at uh, kind of their anxiety level. And, and then, you know, to find out facts you may not know. Let's say instead the witness says, well, I'm really worried about this memo, you know, where we admitted that our product was defective. And you may look at them and say, what memo? And then, you know, you found the memo. Uh, so it's great. Uh, this advice about open-ended questions and asking things like, is there anything about this deposition that worries you or anything about the case that worries you or anything that I've said to you seem inconsistent or is it, is it not? Uh, if, I, if I said anything wrong, asking those kinds of questions can really um, put the witness at ease and also, uh, you know, you may learn things that you need to know and didn't know until you asked the question. Um, having the witness tell you the story in chronological order is often a really good way to organize things. People tend to think about things in chronological order. Um, you obviously have the, the broader perspective on the case. You, you are, if it's a 10-year period, you've, you, know, you know things about the beginning, middle, and the end. This witness may have only been involved in the beginning or only involved in the end. Uh, so it's good to sort of see how the witness thinks about it and, and how he or she, what, what events he or she would include in a timeline to make sure you're aware of them. Um, Considering whether to refresh a witness's recollection uh, is something you need to think about, and we talked briefly about it. Um, generally, you don't want to refresh recollection. A deposition is a defensive exercise. If somebody truthfully doesn't know or doesn't recall an answer, that's the answer that he or she should give in a deposition. Um, there are limited circumstances where you may need to refresh a witness's recollection if it was a critical meeting in, in a, uh, that's involved in the case or a critical phone call or a critical decision and your witness for whatever reason five years ago has no recollection of any kind, you know, you, that's where you have to think about, well, do, do I really need this witness to testify about this or is I don't know okay? I think the default is I don't know is okay, but you have to put an asterisk there uh, to deal with certain circumstances. So related to this is when you do use documents to refresh a witness's recollection, you will need to produce those documents if they're not otherwise responsive. So, you know, and, and the rules in, in this have changed a little bit over the last few years, but in general, if you're, you know, you want to start out with the, uh, with the proposition that you're only showing witnesses uh, documents that have been produced in the litigation. That, that's your universe of documents that you're showing a witness. You shouldn't be showing a, doc a document that hasn't been produced because if it does refresh the witness's recollection, uh, you would be required to produce it. Question about privileged information. If the document is privileged, do you have to produce it? And there's actually a split of authority on that point. Uh, again, I think the better practice is you know, very strong presumption not showing a witness any document that wasn't produced in the lawsuit, uh, you know, in, in, you know, for the, the, the benefit of showing a witness a document uh, that hasn't been produced is often outweighed by the, the possibility that you'll have to produce that document, particularly if it's a document over which you would want to claim uh, attorney-client or work product privilege. Um, in terms of procedure, so that was substance, this is procedure. Um, critical thing, of course, you're going to tell the witness, always tell the truth. I mean, that is the most important thing in a deposition. Um, you know, we've all seen the, the, the clips from, from movies about, you know, well, what, what, did, your, what did your client, uh, what did your lawyer tell you to, 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 to say in the deposition? Well, he just told me to tell the truth. Objection, you know, uh, <laughs> a privilege. I mean, it's, it's sort of one of those things that's almost cliche. But, you know, it, it is the most important thing. You, there are serious consequences for witnesses who don't tell the truth in depositions, uh, not only potential sanctions, but uh, impeachment. I mean, if you're lying or shading the truth in a deposition, your credibility uh, can go to zero if the other side's lawyer uh, finds out about it and is able to impeach you. So it's tactically the wrong uh, approach and, and also, of course, ethically and legally the wrong approach. How the truth is presented can really be critical. Uh, so it's, it's tell the truth, but 
if you use colorful language uh, or sound bites to describe the truth, uh, that is going to be worse in general for you than being very, you know, just the facts, ma'am type of approach. I mean, you, you want to be uh, very bland in your deposition. You don't, you don't want to be using colorful language. You don't want to exaggerate. You just want to, you know, answer the question truthfully, only the question that's asked, and just sit there and wait for the next question. That's the kind of advice that you need to give uh, your witness uh, when you're preparing him or her to testify. Now, one of the ways to, to do this is the video, and, and let's talk a little bit about it now. Um, so I had an interesting uh, approach to this. I was you know, working as a litigator at Davis Polk for many years, prepped a lot of witnesses for deposition, uh, and then when I moved in-house at NBC Universal, was doing the same thing. And I'd never used a video uh, in all my career to prepare a witness to testify. Didn't even know that such a thing existed. When I went in house at NBC Universal, they were using an old video there, and I, tr I tried it out. And it, it was funny because the video, I think, was from the 1980s, and it looked very dated. Uh, but surprisingly, it worked pretty well. I mean, I would show this to to witnesses, and they would really benefit from having seen a witness doing it wrong, getting in trouble through honest mistakes. I mean, honestly trying to speculate to come to an answer, but then being impeached because they turned out to be wrong, and what could happen there. And then seeing a witness doing it right, it really helped the witnesses uh, understand how a deposition works and what, how you should answer deposition questions and what to emulate. So I decided to write and produce a new video, uh, Deposition Testimony, Five Simple Rules, which I then uh, started using with my clients and now is available to law firms uh, generally. And it's really the same idea, except now it's completely modern. Uh, it looks like a feature film, and it's available uh, not only on DVD, but also online so that lawyers can use it uh, with their clients anywhere the client's located. So you can now email a client a link and a password, and the client can you know, log in. And if they're able to watch a YouTube video, uh, they're able to watch this deposition prep video. And it's just very convenient, and it's very effective. Um, so that's sort of the history of how this product came about. Um, in terms of how law firms use it, there's uh, definitely some who use it uh, on a pay-per-view basis. So you just, you know, if you have a witness you're preparing, you pay uh, a certain amount to, to use it for a 30-day period. And then, um, you know, then there's a, a specific uh, charge per use, and some firms choose then to pass that charge on to their clients. It, they think of it as uh, like a court reporting fee or something, transcript fee, uh, anything. It's expenses related to a deposition, just like those other things, and so they, uh, you know, pass that through. Other law firms uh, tend to absorb the cost themselves, and they often choose for uh, choose an annual license type of a model where they get an all-you-can-eat plan and can use it as much as they like for, uh, you know, a year. Um, so. Those are some of the options. Uh, we're going to show you today uh, an excerpt from the program. Uh, it's about 25 minutes to give you a sense of um, you know, how, the, how the program works. It, it starts with a trial scene where uh, a witness who gave careless testimony in his deposition gets impeached at trial, uh, really uh, in, in an effort to, I think uh, we mentioned before, scaring straight some witnesses who aren't worried enough about their deposition. This is a way to get their attention and hopefully um, have them see the importance of what they're about to do. And then we're going to have uh, the first three rules. Uh, rule number one is, of course, always tell the truth. It's the most important rule, fundamental. Uh, rule number two, don't volunteer. You know, answer only the question you're asked and then wait for the next question. And then rule number three, don't speculate. Just testify about uh, those things that you have personal knowledge of and, and don't speculate about what others uh, may have done or may not have done. Uh, so let's take a look at that now. Shannon Stevens versus Patterson Baird and Company, United States District Court, Trial, Day 4. Shannon Stevens has sued her former employer, claiming she was fired because she is a woman. Pete Roberts, her former boss, is finishing his testimony on direct examination at the trial. <clears throat> Mr. Roberts, why did Patterson Baird and Company decide to terminate Ms. Stevens' employment? Patterson Baird's revenues were down substantially and we needed to cut costs. Unfortunately, Ms. Stevens was one of several underperforming employees who we had to let go. Did the decision to let Ms. Stevens go have anything to do with the fact that she is a woman? Absolutely not. No further questions, Your Honor. <laughs> Your witness, Consul. Mr. Roberts, Patterson Baird recently lost the Republic Airlines account, didn't it? Yes. And that was one of your company's biggest clients, wasn't it? Yes, it was. 
In fact, that was the primary reason that Patterson Baird's revenues were down, wasn't it? There are a number of reasons why our revenues were down. But that was the main one, wasn't it? I'm not sure about that. Someone in our finance group would know if that's true, but I really can't say. You can't say? No. Do you recall having your deposition taken in this case, Mr. Roberts? Yes. And at that time, you were under oath, weren't you? Yes. Same oath you're under here today, right? That's correct. The one to tell the truth? Yes. Your Honor, permission to play excerpt number 10 from Mr. Roberts' deposition, lines 1 through 25. Any objection? Yes, Your Honor. The testimony is not impeaching and it contains speculation. Overruled. Why did you fire Ms. Stevens? Unfortunately, I didn't have much choice. Our revenues were way down, and I was under strict orders from the powers that be to drastically cut costs in our group. How so? Well, it was pretty brutal. We had just lost the Republic Airlines account, which frankly was a total disaster. That account alone brought in $2 million in the third quarter, so that just killed us for the year. Was that the main reason Patterson Baird's revenues were down? I'm sure it was. I've always understood from the boys in finance that Republic Airlines brought in more revenue than our other top 10 clients combined. No other client was bringing in as much revenue, I can tell you that. Mr. Roberts, you just finished telling this jury that you didn't fire my client because she was a woman, but because she was underperforming as an account manager, right? Yes, that's correct. Was my client responsible for the Republic Airlines account? No, she wasn't. Who was? I was. Were you fired for underperforming? No, I wasn't. Did your boss, John Patterson, ever put pressure on you to fire my client? No. He didn't? No. He didn't tell you you had to reduce headcount in your group by 10%? Yes, he did. And at that time, how many people were in your group? 10. And how many of those were women? Just the one. Shannon Stevens? Yes. That's pretty easy math. I see what you're implying, but John wasn't telling me to fire her. In fact, John didn't even tell me I had to reduce my head count until after she was, well, let go. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Your Honor, permission to play excerpt number 25 from Mr. Roberts' deposition lines 5 through 10. Any objection? No, Your Honor. So John Patterson told you you had to reduce head count in your group by 10% in a conversation that you and he had in January? Yes. Mr. Roberts, you're aware that Ms. Stevens was fired in February, right? Well, yes. But when I said that in my deposition, I was just guessing. I wasn't really sure when John and I had had that conversation. Mr. Roberts, were you given a copy of your deposition shortly after it was taken? Yes. And was that copy a word-for-word -word transcription of every question you were asked and every answer that you gave during your deposition? Yes, but... And weren't you given plenty of time to make any corrections that you deemed necessary in order to render that testimony accurate? Yes, And you, but... in fact, made some changes to some of your other answers, didn't you? Yes, I but did. But you didn't change a word of that answer, did you? No. <laughs> no further questions for this witness, Your Honor. Patterson Baird and Company didn't fire Shannon Stevens because she is a woman, and they were well within their rights to terminate her employment. Nevertheless, the company was forced to pay a large sum to settle her claims because Pete Roberts and two other company employees were discredited at trial by testimony that they gave in their pre-trial depositions. Let's take a look at what Pete did wrong and how his mistakes and the company's misfortunes could have been avoided if he had followed just a few simple rules for testifying at a deposition. Rule number one, always tell the truth. Although depositions often take place in a conference room or other informal setting, you should never forget that it is a formal proceeding under oath 
and that your testimony at deposition carries with it all of the significance as if you were sitting in a court of law before a judge and a jury. Of all the advice in this program, this is the most important and also the easiest to follow. You must always tell the truth in answering questions at your deposition. The law requires you to be truthful, and there could be significant penalties against both you and your company if you are shown to intentionally testify falsely. In addition, the other side's lawyer can use any inconsistency between your testimony and the other facts in the case to undermine your credibility before a judge or jury. As a result, you must never assume that it is a good idea to lie at your deposition. Pete Roberts told the truth at his deposition, but he still ran into trouble because he failed to follow the other rules for testifying in a deposition. Rule number two, don't volunteer. Mr. Roberts, what is your position at Patterson, Baird & Company? I am a vice president in the account management group. I've held that position for the past three years. And what are your primary responsibilities? <laughs> making sure all of our clients are happy and spending all of their ad dollars with us. And making sure none of them leave us for another agency. You know, the easy stuff. I also supervise the account managers who work in our group. Was Shannon Stevens one of the account managers you supervised? Yes, she was. Why did you fire her? Unfortunately, I didn't have much choice. Our revenues were way down, and I was under strict orders from the powers that be to drastically cut costs in our group. How so? Well, it was pretty brutal. We had just lost the Republic Airlines account, which frankly was a total disaster. That account alone had brought in $2 million in the third quarter, so that just killed us for the year. Was that the main reason Patterson Baird's revenues were down? Yeah, I'm sure it was. I've always understood from the boys in finance that Republic Airlines brought in more revenue than our other top 10 clients combined. No other client was bringing in as much revenue, I can tell you that. So what happened next? Well, one day John Patterson came to me and said, we need to reduce the company's headcount, and you have got to cut your group by 10%. Did he? Yeah, he did. And so I took a look at each of the 10 managers in the group, who was handling which accounts, who was bringing in what revenue, that's how I made my decision that Shannon Stevens was the one who we had to let go. And at that time, how many of those 10 managers were women? Just the one. Shannon Stevens? Yes. You mentioned Republic Airlines. Who handled that account? That was one of my accounts. Tough luck, huh? In my defense, those guys were a handful, even as far as clients go. You're a lawyer, so you know how tough clients can be, right? I thought we were going to have to sue them when they refused to pay our last batch of invoices, but they came to their senses and we worked something out. What did Pete do wrong in answering these questions at his deposition? Unfortunately, almost everything. Your job in your deposition is to take your time and to listen very carefully to each question and to answer only the question that you are asked. It's a common mistake to think that if you tell the other side's lawyer everything you know, he or she will see the light and perhaps drop the case or maybe just make the deposition a little shorter. You might do this in a business meeting or in a conversation, but you should not do it in a deposition. Why? Because information in a lawsuit is power. When you volunteer, what you may think is harmless information, often the other side's lawyer will find a way to use that information against you and your company. Here, Pete volunteered a lot of information that he thought was harmless in response to questions that didn't ask for it. For example, Pete volunteered that his company's revenues were down because they lost the Republic Airlines account. Ms. Stevens' lawyers used that free information to ask Pete several more questions about the Republic Airlines account. Who was responsible for that account, whether or not it was a main source of the company's revenues. Her lawyer then used that free information against Pete and the company at trial to suggest that the decision to terminate her was discriminatory. At your deposition, listen very carefully to each question and then stop and think about it 
and then answer only that question. It's good practice to start using this technique yes, from the very beginning of your deposition, when the other side's lawyer often will ask some basic background questions about you, your education, your employment history, your job duties. And if you start using that technique of listening, pausing, and limiting your answer just to the question, then you will be in good shape and practice to answer in the same fashion when you're being asked questions that are more substantive and material to the lawsuit. Let's see how a more careful and thoughtful witness would have handled the questions Pete Roberts was asked at his deposition. Mr. Morgan, what is your position at Patterson Baird & Company? Vice President, Account Management. What are your primary responsibilities? I supervise the firm's account managers. Was Shannon Stevens one of the account managers you supervised? Yes. Is Ms. Stevens still employed by Patterson Baird? No. Why not? She was let go. Why was she let go? Patterson Baird's revenues were down substantially and we had to cut costs. Unfortunately, Ms. Stevens was one of several underperforming employees we had to let go. When you say revenues were down, what do you mean by that? Revenues were lower than they had been in the past. And why was that? There are many reasons for that. What are they? Well, one reason was our clients in general are spending less money on advertising than in the past. Is that the only reason? No. What are the other reasons? Another reason is that increased competition among agencies has lowered the commission we're able to charge our clients. Okay, fine. You've testified that Patterson Baird needed to cut costs. What I'm asking you is how did the company's need to cut back result in the decision to fire my client? It was one of the reasons she was let go. Was it the only reason? No. What were the other reasons? She was underperforming. Underperforming relative to what? The other account managers. Which ones? All of them. Dan Morgan is a careful and thoughtful witness. He's listening carefully to each question and he's answering only that question. He's not having a conversation with the other side's lawyer, and he's not volunteering information. As a result, Dan is calm and in control of his deposition. No one other than the lawyers who are involved in the lawsuit will read your deposition from cover to cover. On the contrary, it's likely that the judge and the jury are only going to see excerpts from your deposition testimony that the other side's lawyers believe are helpful to their case. For this reason, you should strive to avoid giving the other side's lawyers sound bites that they can use against you or the company at trial. One way to do this no. is to focus your testimony on who did what and who said what, and to avoid characterizing or commenting on those events. Depositions tend to last several hours, and in some cases, several days. And it's a natural tendency to want to try and inject some humor or sarcasm to help lighten the mood or move things along or relieve some tension. You should resist that temptation because those comments, when taken out of context, can be used to put you and the company in a bad light. When Pete used the words brutal and disaster and the phrase, and that just killed us for the year, he was serving up some terrific sound bites for Ms. Stevens' lawyer to use against him and the company at trial. I'm not saying that at all. As you know, Pete should not have been volunteering this information in the first place because he wasn't asked specific questions about Republic Airlines. But he compounded that mistake by describing those events in colorful, exaggerated, and quotable sound bites. When testifying, you shouldn't comment or characterize the events that you're testifying about. Simply state what you did, what you said, 
And in doing so, you'll avoid giving the other side's lawyer ammunition to use against you at the time of trial. It's also wise to avoid absolutes. For example, even if you regularly read your emails, for you to testify that you always read your emails may be wrong because there are instances when you may be out of the office or on vacation where you don't always read your emails. You're less likely to be wrong if you avoid words such as always or never in giving your deposition. Rule number three, don't speculate. Some questions will ask you to speculate, which means that they're asking you to testify about what somebody else knew or did or said. But that is not your role in a deposition. If in a deposition you're asked to give testimony about what somebody else did or said or thought, unless you have direct personal knowledge of that information, the truthful and correct answer to such questions is to say, I don't know. Did you, in fact, reduce headcount in your group by 10%? Yes. Did the rest of the company? I don't know. The same is true when you can't remember what you yourself did or said or thought at some time prior to your deposition. Then the truthful and honest answer is to say, I don't recall. Because to say anything else would be speculating or guessing. Did the conversation occur before or after you fired Shannon Stevens? I don't recall. Because depositions often take place months and sometimes even years after the events that you're being asked questions about, it's not surprising that you may not have perfect recollection. And there are events that you may be asked about that you don't recall with perfect clarity. In fact, there may be events that you don't recall at all, even though that you know you were involved in them. If that happens and you truly don't recall, then the proper answer is to say, I don't recall, or I don't remember now. If the other side's lawyer tries to embarrass or bully you because you said you don't recall, you need to stick to your guns if that's the honest answer. And you don't change that answer. Unless there is something that happens in the deposition that does refresh your recollection. It could be a document or some new information that comes up in the deposition. And you can always supplement your answer at that time. As Pete Roberts learned the hard way, speculating at a deposition is dangerous and can and probably will be used against you and your company at trial. Mr. Roberts, you're aware that Ms. Stevens was fired in February, right? But when I said that in my deposition, I was just guessing. I wasn't really sure when John and I had had that conversation. Mr. Roberts, were you given a copy of your deposition shortly after it was taken? Yes. And weren't you given plenty of time to make any corrections that you deem necessary in order to render that testimony accurate? Yes. But, but you didn't change a word of that answer, did you? No. No further questions for this witness, Your Honor. Let's see how Pete got himself in trouble by speculating at his deposition. <clears throat> Mr. Roberts, you testified earlier that John Patterson told you you had to reduce headcount in your group by 10%, correct? Yes, that's correct. When did that conversation occur? Wow, that's a good question. It's been a few years now, so I really don't remember when that was. I do remember that we lost the Republic Airlines account in November, and John and I had that conversation at some point after that. I was out of the office for most of December, and I remember that John and I were in my office when we spoke, so it probably was sometime in January, but I'm still not completely sure. You know, it's been a few years now, and I don't recall the date. Mr. Roberts, is it your testimony that you can't remember when your boss came to you and told you you had to fire one of only 10 people you supervised? You couldn't have had many of those conversations. Well, I knew this was coming. Now he's making it look like I don't remember what was obviously an important conversation. Look, I'm 90% sure that John and I spoke in my office at some point in January, so I'm gonna say January. I'm not saying that at all, and I remember the conversation clearly. I'm just not sure of the exact date. Having had a chance to think about it, I believe John and I had that conversation at some point in January. So John Patterson told you you had to reduce headcount in your group by 10% in a conversation that you and he had in January? Yes. Thank you. Was Patterson Baird reducing headcount in every group? 
by 10% or just in account management? Let's see, John told me it was 10% in my group, but I'm not sure about the rest of the company. John was in the budget meetings, not me, so I can't be certain. But Steve Jenks in the creative group told me that he had to cut his group by 10%, and I know it was 10% in my group, so it probably was 10% across the board. My understanding is that the firm reduced headcount by 10% in all groups across the company, not just in account management. Pete was speculating at his deposition when he testified that the conversation he had with John Patterson about reducing headcount in his group took place in January, when he really couldn't recall when that conversation occurred. In fact, his conversation with John took place in April, two months after Shannon Stevens was terminated on February 1st. While Pete thought that his speculation was reasonable based on information he did have, it turned out that Pete was wrong, and that innocent mistake was used to discredit him at trial. A careful witness would have handled these questions very differently. Mr. Morgan, you testified earlier that John Patterson told you to reduce headcount in your group by 10%, correct? Yes. When did that conversation occur? I don't recall the date. That's fine. Just give me your best recollection of when that conversation took place. I recall the conversation took place several years ago. Can you be any more specific? Based solely on my memory as I sit here today, no, I can't. Mr. Morgan, is it your testimony that you can't remember when your boss came to you and told you you had to fire one of only 10 employees that you supervised? You couldn't have had many of those conversations. That is not my testimony. What is your testimony? I recall a conversation in which John Patterson told me I was to reduce headcount in my group by 10%. Now, as I sit here today, I can't recall exactly when that conversation took place, only that it occurred several years ago. Did it occur before or after you fired Shannon Stevens? I don't remember. Was Patterson Baird reducing headcount by 10% in every group or just in account management? I was told to reduce headcount in account management by 10%. I can't speak for the others in the company. By declining to speculate about the timing of a conversation that he now does not recall, or by declining to testify about what others may have done or not done, Dan skillfully avoided the traps Pete Roberts fell into at his deposition. It's important in your deposition to remember who you are and who you are not. By the same token, it's important to remember what your job duties and responsibilities are and what they are not. If you're asked to testify about events and circumstances and issues that are outside your scope of responsibility and of which you have no personal knowledge, then the appropriate answer is to say, I don't know. If you find yourself testifying in your deposition about what somebody else knew or did, you may very well be speculating. It is particularly dangerous if you are being asked to testify about what the company, in a collective sense, knew or did. Testify only about what you actually recall that you knew or did, and only if you're confident at the time of your deposition that you actually remember those thoughts or those events. And if you do that, you'll stay on solid ground. So now that you've had a chance to see the first part of the deposition prep video, uh, I wanted to focus in on a few things that for senior executives, why using deposition prep video is particularly effective. Um, the first thing is one we've mentioned before, the scaring them straight. Uh, you need to make sure that they take this seriously, that they realize, like the witness in the video, that innocent speculation at a deposition can be twisted, can be taken out of context, can be used to make you and your company look very bad. Uh, and that's not what you want. You want to uh, take it seriously, you want to prepare, and then execute, and then you're done. The second thing is, uh, showing this innocent speculation uh, and how that can be twisted. It's not uncommon for senior executives, uh, just like the, the witness in the video, to want to reason through something. If they don't remember an exact date or an exact conversation, 
you know, if they want to sit there and think about it and think about what they do remember and then try to put the, you know, thing they can't remember in context and come up with an answer, that's just dangerous. I mean, the, the better answer is I don't know, I don't remember. Trying to work something out uh, is not the right approach in a deposition uh, for uh, senior executives or for anyone else. It's just harder often for senior executives not to, um, you know, try to do that because they don't want to give the answer, I don't know or I don't remember. Um, another critical thing, with senior executives, it's often a, a challenge to get the prep time with them. They're busy people. They don't want to deal with this litigation. They don't want to deal with this deposition. So you're often fighting to get three or four hours of their time. You know, may have to do it over several days. They don't have that uh, amount of time to devote to it. Using a deposition prep video is a way that you can squeeze in a little extra prep time with them. And the way you would do that is maybe after your first in-person meeting, you send them an email with the link and password and say, hey, between our, our meeting today and our next meeting you know, next week, Take, take 45 minutes, watch this program, and then when they come back the second time, you can sit down with them and say, hey, did you have any questions about what you saw? You can reinforce the advice that they were given. Uh, and so it's a sort of a way to squeeze an extra 45 minutes of prep time uh, out of them when uh, you're not with them. And then you can focus your in-person time really on the key facts and issues in the case uh, and doing a little bit of a mock deposition or mock questioning. Um, another thing the video does well is covering the basics without talking down to the witness. So the video will cover the rules, the simple rules, and you don't have to do that. I mean, you'll want to reinforce and, and ask if they have questions about any of the particular rules. But um, being able to offload that kind of rote uh, basic um, advice is, is good because you don't want to be seen as if you're you know, talking down to the witness or condescending. This is your client. You want to focus them in your time with them on the real important think issues in the case and not just talking about you know, don't volunteer, read the documents, et cetera. Um, the really critical thing is just being able to see, in addition to being told, how to give a good deposition. And that's, I think, the real benefit of the video. I've seen many witnesses who, uh, after having seen the video, have gone from hopelessly lost in, in terms of how to respond to questions in a deposition, having no idea what to do, uh, to really understanding it and doing a great job. I, the real impetus of this for me was having had the experience many, many times of spending hours, uh, sometimes days, with witnesses, preparing them for depositions, giving them all the advice that I'm sure every litigator who's watching this gives, you know, don't volunteer, don't speculate, you got it, you're just going to be, you know, answer the question you're asked, right? Got it? Good. Five minutes into the deposition, the witness is, is volunteering, is speculating, the deposition is starting to go sideways, and you're just sort of kicking yourself, wondering, what, what could I have done better? I mean, I, I give all this advice, and the witness just isn't following it. The critical thing is until they can see it being done wrong and then see it being done right, they, they can't connect the two. They can't connect what you're telling them with how to actually behave, because depositions are completely foreign. I mean, nobody... Nobody a deposition is not a conversation. It's not a business meeting. Nobody ever speaks that way. Nobody would ever, you know, just answer a question as narrowly as possible and then sit there silently <laughs> until the other person asks another question. It's just a foreign experience, and they need to see it done wrong, and they need to see it done right, and that's really what the video will do for your clients. So the last thing uh, in terms of practice for witnesses is you should do practice. I mean, you should do some mock questioning in your prep sessions. It's good uh, practice. You can uh, have a colleague of yours come in and, and ask the questions of your witness. You can practice uh, objecting, defending. Uh, this is always good to do a little bit of uh, mock deposition. Um, you shouldn't wait until the last minute to do this, though. Uh, you know, of course, it's always going to depend on the schedule and how much time you have, but you know, generally starting early and spacing out the preparation is a good approach. Um, you don't want to, you know, the, there may be things that you learn in a prep session that are very important that you didn't know, and they may require you to go out and talk to other people. And if you only have, you know, if the depositions tomorrow, you may not have time to do all that. So being prepared and, and starting early is always a good idea. Um, and then over prepping, it, it certainly can happen. Um, you can prep too much. Uh, you know, the witness then gets really nervous about the deposition. If you've spent, you know, five days preparing somebody for a deposition, that may not be the right approach either. So you just have to use your judgment. I think you'll get a good sense after you've been doing this for a while uh, how much a witness needs and how much is, is over prepping. In terms of senior executives, I would say the things to focus on here in terms of the practice is to really challenge them. Um, 
you know, in the particular arena uh, of litigation, you are the expert. Uh, you know, unlike uh, the business where they are the expert, this is your job. This, this is what you know. You, you're the expert. And they should defer to you in that area, and they, and they will. So it's important that if they say something to you that doesn't seem right, you should feel free to challenge them. Uh, they may be very, you know, in their normal life. Uh, used to dealing with a lot of yes people. You know, everybody's just saying yes, sir, and yeah, of course you're right, sir. I'll go do that right away. But litigation doesn't work that way. I mean, they're going to have the other side's lawyer uh, challenging everything they say uh, in the deposition or in in motions or at the trial. And it's important for you to you know kind of play that role and, and don't be afraid to challenge something that uh, a senior executive says if you think it's inconsistent with what you understand to be the truth or uh, you know inconsistent with your theory you, you may end up needing to revise your theory but you shouldn't defer to senior executives uh, you're, you're doing them a disservice if you do that in a deposition prep scenario um, assuming that a witness gets it just because they've been deposed before <laughs> is also very dangerous I mean certainly a witness that's been deposed uh, 10 times probably knows the ropes pretty well, but somebody who's been deposed once before, and maybe that once before was in some family law matter, they, you know, they were a trustee, and it was you know, a very different type of a deposition. The other side you know, may have been a third party situation where they were you know, not, not directly involved. Uh, you know, versus this case where maybe they're the critical witness or it's a, it's a critical issue for their current company. You just need to be sensitive to that. People may think, oh, yeah, I've been through that before, but, you know, that was in a, a small personal injury type of situation or an auto accident or d d you name it. It may be very, very different than what they're going to experience in a complex uh, civil case, for example. And then lastly, I think practicing like you play um, is a good advice. So when you're doing your mock questioning, if you're able to you know, if you know the, uh, by, by the third or fourth deposition in a case, you know the style of the uh, lawyer that you're, uh, that's opposing you, and maybe that person has the uh, approach of being everyone's best friend in the hope that that elicits more information, or maybe they're a tough questioner and they're, you know, going after the witness from the start, or maybe they're, you know, very good and they do both. They, they start off by being the witness's friend and then they, you know, once they've got the information they want, they go aggressively after the witness. If you know the other side's style, it's a great idea to try to mimic that as much as you can. If you don't know the other side's style, then you should prepare your witness for sort of both extremes. Uh, but I think as much realism as you can bring uh, to this uh, sort of mock depositioning and, and actually talking about the issues in your case uh, and the documents in your case is really very valuable. I think it's a great complement to the sort of general uh, scenario that's presented uh, by the deposition prep video. Then you make it very personal by bringing it into the context of this case, into the context of the lawyer that's going to be taking the deposition, and into the context of the particular documents and issues. And I think those two things together make for a very effective uh, witness preparation, both for uh, senior executives and really anyone who's being deposed. So that's uh, the program for today. I hope you uh, found it helpful. Thanks for tuning in.